dedicated attack helicopters first came into service in the late 1960s. Since then, they have proliferated all around the world, with a dozen types made in various countries. On one hand, they still seem to be going strong, but even in the 1980s there were doomsayers citing the risks. And indeed there were instances since which showed how vulnerable attack helicopters are. Not least of which are recent war developments, where Russia seems to have lost at least two dozen attack helicopters. But are all those harbingers of what's to come? Are attack helicopters doomed? And are they already obsolete today? Attack helicopters are not the only endangered species. Unbiased news sources are increasingly becoming hard to find as well. Ground News, sponsoring this video, is trying to fight that. Here's the problem. Sensationalized content is getting more widespread. Manipulative algorithms are used to feed you various news in social media feeds and result as possible misinformation or polarization as you're fed just one side of the story. That's where Ground News steps in. They're an app and a website that show you how a piece of breaking news is being covered across the political spectrum. Now look at this, I can easily swipe between headlines using the headline comparison tool to see how the same story is being reported by various sources. I can check the factuality score of the story and its bias. Certain news stories are usually underreported either by the left or the right and I can see who's financing the media source behind the article. What I really love is that Ground News gives me an uncluttered, non-sensationalistic overview of all the news headlines. Feed customization tool is great and I love that I can track my own reading habits so I see if I have relied on biased sources. You can try out Ground News for free by going to ground.news binkov or by clicking on the link in the video description. Subscribe to get the big picture free of media bias and support a small independent team striving to make the news more transparent. Back to our video. One would say the attack helicopter is still going strong. The US is making a new helicopter type, the future attack recon helicopter. India is finishing development of their light attack chopper. And China is allegedly working on a heavy attack helicopter for the future too. Those come on top of various existing chopper types being bought by various countries. Basically all the militaries around the world that can afford attack helicopters use them or are trying to procure them. So attack helicopters have their use. But the environment they fly in today is not the same as one they encountered when they were first devised. At the turn of the decade in the late 1960s, air defense radars were big, expensive and not numerous. SAM systems existed, but they were generally geared against high-flying planes. Shoulder-launched missiles were brand new, untested and had to directly face a hot jet engine exhaust to even achieve a lock-on, which means they were generally useless against helicopters. The mission set of attack helicopters is quite a niche one, however. They are generally slow, they are fairly loud and they generally can't fly high up in the air. Most attack helicopters, laden for missions, can't fly over shoulder-launched missile threats, for example. Their usage doctrine has always been this, fly so low that enemy radars can't detect you, then perform a hit-and-run attack before the enemy can react to you and try to bring you down. As such, attack helicopters are usually frontline weapons, not meant to go beyond the frontline and deep into enemy rear areas. But the pace of technological development in these last several decades was not even. While certain technologies like long-range sensors and long-range missiles helped the attack helicopter, technologies similar to those helped the anti-air defenses even more. Today, shoulder-launched missiles are immensely lethal. Their sensors are sensitive enough that they can lock onto helicopters even at their maximum ranges. Other types of shoulder-launch class missiles use laser guidance, which is hard to spoof even with various decoys, and requires measures which aim to blind the seeker inside the missile with the laser beam. Furthermore, acquisition radars have become so cheap that they're ubiquitous on the battlefields of today. Even man-pad units will often come with a radar aiding the whole battery. And pretty much all other frontline SAM systems will now feature acquisition radars on every single firing vehicle. Previously, Soviet systems like the Strela-10 did not use such radars on every vehicle. Today, their successors like the TOR system rely on very potent radars. 
The Sosna R, supposed to replace the Strela, while radarless, can count on much better optical and thermal sensors. At the same time, helicopters of today have not managed to shrink their radar or thermal signature enough to compensate for enemies' technological advances. Sure, small details like redirection of exhaust heat towards the rotor and various IR suppressors are attempted. Even some radar-absorbing materials are sporadically used. But those won't really beat a SAM system 5 or 10 miles away from locking onto them. So what the attack helicopters have focused on instead is relying on ever better sensors of their own. So they don't even come that close to the front line. But the thing is, that only works up to a certain point before it ceases to make sense. The Hellfire missile was used by attack helicopters out to the distance of 5 miles way back in the 1980s. Today's US replacement missile, the Joint Air-to-Ground missile, uses the same rocket motor and is of generally the same size, and maintains the same 5-mile reach despite sensors on the helicopters getting better in the meantime. Curiously, there was the Joint Common Missile program in the Autis, which was to be a completely new high-tech missile that could reach up to 10 miles when fired low from a helicopter. It was not pursued. The British Brimstone 2 missile was tested on Apache helicopters offering a 7.5 mile range. Yet, despite being an already developed missile, it was not pursued. Both the British and the US have settled for missiles with a 5 mile reach for their helicopters. While a helicopter with modern powerful sensors can indeed easily track targets out to 10 or 15 miles, it seems it was decided that the extra cost or missile weight penalty gained by extra range was not worth it. And there are some operational reasons for that. It all really depends on the battlefield topography. If one is waging war over a flat desert or flat farmland, then longer ranges can make sense. But that's a double-edged sword. A flat battlefield also means the helicopter itself has no cover to use and hide behind. Typical frontline SAM systems easily outrange them. Medium-range class SAMs can afford to use big heavy radars and missiles, while attack helicopters can't really use sensors and missiles large enough to compete. On the other hand, such flat battlefields are not common. There's usually always some hill or some woodland or some village to take advantage of and hide the helicopter behind it. That too cuts both ways though. The longer the distance is, the higher chance there is that there would be a bunch of such obstacles between the helicopter and its targets. So even if the helicopter would be able to engage targets at 12 miles away, most of the time the battlefield reality would mean the helicopter would not be able to spot targets from such distances, while flying low. There would usually be various obstacles in between, behind which the target would hide. Flying a bit higher would not be advisable, as that's where helicopters are most vulnerable. While there is the possibility of having someone else right at the front line spotting the target and having the helicopter just launch a missile, that sort of usage would defeat the purpose of an attack helicopter. But in a way, that's already happening. Another big threat to attack helicopters is not enemy SAM systems, but friendly drones. Unmanned aerial vehicles are often much, much cheaper. In 2016, Britain bought 50 new Apache helicopters from the US. The package included initial maintenance, spares and simulators. The overall cost in 2022 dollars would be 55 million per helicopter. Last year, Morocco bought 13 Turkish TB2 drones. It also got support equipment for those. Overall, one drone with all that support costs 5.7 million dollars today. Now, of course, an attack drone does not offer all the capabilities of an attack helicopter. It usually doesn't carry as many missiles. Its attack mission profile is usually limited to strikes from afar. While the helicopter can sometimes afford to come in close, use other weapons too and possibly survive. The drone may not be able to react within a second and its data link may be compromised. Plus, its defenses are mostly non-existent, so if it's targeted, it's usually destroyed. But the drone does have some other additional benefits. Drones can stay airborne several times longer than a helicopter. Their deployment base can be much farther away from the front line. When there is no cover to hide behind on the battlefield, a drone can be harder to spot by enemy sensors. It's more optimized for those medium altitudes, from where it can better utilize its sensors. But let us get back to the cost. Bayraktar TB2 drones aren't just 10 times cheaper initially, but much more over their lifetime of use. 
Their ground crews servicing the aircraft are smaller than Apache's. They require one operator, while the Apache needs two pilots. Overall flight hour costs for the Apache are much higher than for the TB2. In fact, they're over 10 times as high even when compared to a Predator drone, which is larger and more complex than the TB2 drone. So drones could be used in larger numbers to compensate for some of their current deficiencies. And even if some are lost, it wouldn't be as big of a deal. Replacement cost of the bare aircraft is still roughly 10 times smaller, and no pilots would be killed. Added competition to attack helicopters as of lately have been indirect attack platforms. Technology has progressed enough that today a third-party sensor, be it on a recon drone or a vehicle near the front line, can designate a target and send targeting information to a non-line-of-sight missile fired from a distance, and achieve a hit in mere minutes. UK-supplied Brimstone missiles were famously recently used against Russian armor, just fired from a simple truck. They locked onto their targets in flight and basically provided firepower that would usually be provided by an attack helicopter. Such capability is not that new, actually, and has been proliferating. Israel has used spike and loss systems for decades. The UK and South Korea use the same system. China uses a similar system, and interestingly, such systems like the Spike and Loss have been tested by the US Army from an Apache helicopter, hitting a target 20 miles away. But the question then becomes, why even have an attack helicopter for such a mission? Because attack helicopters, even ones being designed today, are designed to get up close and personal and survive. They always require two crew members, they have some armor, they have a lot of self-protection sensors, they often have a gun for close encounters. And all that in the end means the helicopter requires big and expensive turboshaft engines. Attack helicopters can weigh up to 10 tons, but since distributed sensor and communication technology coupled with non-line-of-sight weapons can more and more often enable distant engagements, then why even use attack helicopters? Indeed, more and more often we're seeing utility helicopters armed with missiles for standoff engagements, and lighter recon attack helicopters which don't have a gun at all, like the Japanese OH-1 or the Chinese Z-19. Those don't bother much with armor. Indeed, it's more than likely that armor on attack helicopters will become even less prevalent. Though helicopter armor has always been something of a misconception. Old attack helicopters were regarded as flying tanks in the media but that's not really true. Both the Soviet Mi-24 and US Apache are not that well armored. Many Mi-24s were lost in Afghanistan. And in the 2003 invasion of Iraq, a flight of 30 Apaches were forced to abort their mission when ambushed by Iraqi ground forces. They flew low and got hit mostly by a large caliber machine gun fire, though at least one crew member was wounded by a basic Kalashnikov round. If attack helicopters would be really armored all around, they would weigh tons more than they already do. Crew members are somewhat protected, but usually even the side cockpit windows are not armored, the exception being the Russian Mi-28 helicopter, which is probably the most heavily armored helicopter out there. But it is still not the one preferred by the Russian forces today. Back in 1999, the US was prepared to use many Apache helicopters to fly into Kosovo. But at the last minute, the mission was called off as the threat level was too high. That was against the Yugoslavian military of 20 years ago. So imagine what would the threat levels be today against a near-peer opponent. Indeed, the Russian military has managed to lose at least 28 attack helicopters in the first 100 or so days of the war against an opponent that, on paper, wasn't supposed to be a peer opponent. But today, trying to use attack helicopters for close air support very close to the front line is just too dangerous. Shoulder-launched missiles have gotten much, much better in the last few decades, and armor is not going to help that much against a precise close-by detonation. Attack helicopter's best bet today is to rely on the entire network of sensors, with real-time updates of the threats around it, then to use the surroundings to keep hidden. That's something Russian helicopters have lacked recently, for example. Then the helicopters should pop up for a kill from a considerable distance, for a short moment. That type of usage is of course very old, but it just shows that all the technological advances of the last few decades did not free attack helicopters of that constraint. 
Unmanned aerial vehicles generally can't hide behind cover and must fly a bit higher, making them more vulnerable. But they are still being used more and more. Their low cost and expendability seems to be well worth the risk. The US Army, often considered at the forefront of technology, is right now developing the FARA program, a lighter recon attack helicopter which will replace roughly half of the heavy Apache helicopters. The other half are to be replaced later in the future by something else. And that something else may in the end not even resemble an attack helicopter of today, but perhaps a fast tilt rotor unmanned drone. At some point into the future, attack helicopters are destined to disappear. Their mission set is likely to get distributed to other platforms, like a distributed network of sensors and standoff firepower platforms. And if there is a need to have a direct attack flying platform, that's more likely to come in the form of a swarm of smaller drones with distributed abilities. Some being sensor drones, some being decoy drones, some being missile drones. The attack helicopter today is not yet obsolete, but its days are numbered. More so than those of the main battle tanks, for example. Tanks are more likely to remain present on future battlefields for a few decades longer than attack helicopters. But that's another story for another video. A story that shall also be told. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.